Another segment by the Midwest Marks Institute. Today we're going to be talking about Seymour Hersh's uh, latest Substack article where he touches on the role that the U.S. played in blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline. We're also going to hit on, uh, we were unable to finish uh, touching last stream that we had, uh, which include AOC's uh, reply to uh, Ilhan Omar kicked out of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we're also going to react to Bill Maurer's uh, video uh, spewing anti-communist propaganda. We're also going to be talking about uh, Christian Parenti's uh, interview on the Katie Halper show where he discusses what he calls diversity ideology. And uh, if we have time, we'll also talk about my recent article uh, on the necessity of combating national and historical nihilism. So without further ado, we can get started with our introduction. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I uh, hope you enjoyed that intro. I know I've been enjoying it lately. Um, <clears throat> the first thing we want to talk about today is the Nord Stream pipeline and the recent article from Seymour Hirsch. Uh, and I see some people in the chat are already, you know, surprised and asking. It's been confirmed about Nord Stream. Um, pretty much, you know, about as as much proof as we're gonna get probably um, was just revealed from the famed journalist Seymour Hirsch one of the most famous investigative journalists in American history, um, somebody who's been involved with the Watergate scandal, somebody who revealed the My Lai massacre of civilians committed by um, the U.S. military in Vietnam all the way back in the late 1960s. Um, and, you know, he's stayed uh, relevant and prevalent um, in, in American journalism uh, even revealing the Abu Ghraib torture site um, in Iraq uh, carried out by the U.S. military, um, which was used to gain justification for the invasion of Iraq. They would torture people and say, tell us that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. Tell us what we want to hear. Um, and then, you know, they would waterboard people or whatever until they told the U.S. what they wanted. And then those um, those confessions gained through torture were used as the justification for a war that killed millions. So this was all revealed by Seymour Hirsch, who now, you know, a lot of mainstream media outlets are trying to dismiss as a conspiracy theorist who shouldn't be taken seriously um, because he's revealed in this very well-sourced, um, very thorough and detailed piece um, that it was the U.S. military all along who blew up this pipeline. Um, and, you know, some people were patting us on the back and giving us credit for predicting this because just a few days after the pipeline was sabotaged, we said, clearly this isn't Russia as the you know U.S. mainstream media was claiming. Why would Russia sabotage their own infrastructure that the U.S. State Department um, had, had promised to uh, destroy or said they wanted to destroy or shut down many times? Um, it was in the U.S.'s interest to do this. It was not in Russia's interest to do this. So now we know there was an operation um, that was stationed in Norway uh, that the U.S. planned for a while. A lot of the main players in this were Victoria Nuland, who you would expect, one of the main players in the 2014 um, Euromaidan U.S.-backed color revolution in Ukraine. Um, I believe she was serving as the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine at the time. Um, and then you have Anthony Blinken, who is just, you know, neoliberalism personified 
the foreign policy arm of the Biden administration, um, who's done nothing except push for more sanctions, more war, more hostility, um, and more, you know, finance capital hegemony and dominance globally. Um, so those were the major players who pushed for this. And, you know, as we said, as I said um, on TikTok, for those of you who follow us on TikTok, or I guess I think um, I've said it on the YouTube as well, um, there were a lot of people like Philip DeFranco, who has millions of followers and is, you know, kind of the main news channel on um, TikTok, who were, were saying that this was Russia who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. And anybody saying that it was the U.S. is a conspiracy theorist or a Russian propagandist or a puppet of Putin. Um, so now it's been proven. But how much damage have those people done, you know, by shouting from the rooftops over and over and over again that it was Russia? You know, this is probably the most widely viewed Substack piece I've ever seen here from Seymour Hirsch. But you know, there are going to be millions and millions of people who don't read this, and this piece is going to be suppressed by the mainstream media. Um, so it's also our job to get it out there, though, and educate people on this. Um, and shout out to Seymour Hirsch for another amazing piece of investigative journalism. And uh, I just want to add that uh, this plot to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline came uh, well before the invasion. They are planning on how to disrupt the pipeline because remember the pipeline is uh, one of the central sources of energy for germany which was being supplied by russian gas and one of the main sources of, of energy for large parts of europe so that's obviously not uh, in the interest of uh, american um, uh, capital uh, for that for those conditions to continue to exist and so you know since february 7th of uh, last year again before uh, russia's special operations started in ukraine uh, Biden said, quote, if Russia invades, there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it. This was a statement that caught the people that were involved in the operations completely off guard. They were like, you know, this this whole time we were planning this as a covert operation. We did everything we kind of needed to do to keep it a secret operation. And, and then here comes our president uh, uh, basically saying the obvious, uh, which is that if, if, if Russia does what it was basically forced to do, then we're going to retaliate by by making sure that the Nord Stream pipeline no longer exists and that Russia can't use that as a as a chip in getting Europe to uh, take less, uh, 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 take more of its side and less of the U.S. side in, in, in terms of how it reacts against Russia, maybe not sanctioning Russia because it knows that it depends on Russia for its gas. Victoria Newland uh, also said, uh, uh, shortly after Biden said that, that uh, she said, I want to be very clear with you. If Russia invades Ukraine one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will uh, not move forward. So again, you know, uh, the, the ruling class media, which all it really does is exist in order to set the, the stage for war, to, to play the drums that lead us into war. It's been uh, formulating the narrative that from the start, this has been something that Russia did, which you know, why Russia would do something that's so clearly against its interest, it's never been able to answer. And then slowly with time, it's sort of left the answer of, of who did it kind of vague. Uh, but, but from the start, the U.S. officials themselves have basically uh, said the obvious out loud, which is that they had the capacity to do it and that if things ended up turning out how they ended up turning out, that they would end up doing it. So again, um, uh, these are things that are coming out into the air and that are being proved. But really, if you've been looking at the development of the situation critically and comprehensively, as we have been doing here at the Midwestern Marx Institute, these are things that you knew um, were basically a fact uh, and that uh, it's kind of crazy that, you know, the things we were called, the accounts that we had banned because we were saying the truth. And, you know, this is a similar thing that has happened to anti-war, anti-imperialist voices over and over and over again. You know, one of my favorite sayings of Eddie's is that everyone's an anti-imperialist in hindsight. And we're going to see that once again here with uh, with Ukraine and specifically with the issue of blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline, where only now are, are the folks that have been calling us Putin apologists for our positions going to have to retract and say, you know, well, maybe you were right, at least on, on this issue. So it's 
again, I, I don't think that there's uh, it, 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 it plays an important part, but they're, now they're trying to reject uh, uh, Seymour Hersh's work. Uh, Wikipedia, not just the, the mainstream media, but Wikipedia, which we know has a bunch of money from the State Department behind it, has one of the first uh, characterizations in Seymour Hersh's profile uh, as a conspiracy theory theorist, which is absurd because you know the, the the point of journalism should be to be a guard dog for the politicians to catch them when they're lying and to be suspicious and, and be able to expose the truth to the people. That's what Seymour Hersh does. That's not what the U.S. media does. The, the U.S. media is a bunch of lapdogs of the, the ruling elite, and the lapdogs are calling the critical, um, the guard dog, the person that's actually functioning as a, as a real journalist, they're calling him a, a, a conspiracy theory. So it's a conspiracy theory. So it's a completely topsy-turvy, upside-down world that we're dealing with. Yeah, and I don't know if, you know, Hirsch's pieces about Abu Ghraib or Mylai were published in the New York Times or whatever, but he used to work for some mainstream outlets, you know, and now the the mainstream media is such garbage, you know, and such total utter propaganda and, you know, nothing but parroting of State Department talking points that there's not even really a place for Seymour Hirsch. Like maybe Tucker Carlson will let him come on and do a quick interview, but that'll be it. You know, he won't be allowed on MSNBC. This won't be reported by the Washington Post, the New York Times, you know, any of these uh, media outlets that are owned by oligarchs or, you know, worse, like um, military industrial complex think tanks when you're talking about outlets like the Atlantic Council. Um, <clears throat> and like Carlos said, if you knew the historical context um, of the sabotage of the pipeline, this was an easy prediction. You know, we knew the U.S., um, did it, uh, economists like Jeffrey Sachs were saying from the day it happened, like, this is obviously, you know, uh, a U.S. operation, um, just by knowing, you know, the, the, um, different interests at play there, um, and the U.S.'s history of doing covert operations like this. And really what sucks is that the people of Europe are the ones who get screwed by this, right? Cause they were the ones getting natural gas or um, they were the ones getting energy from this pipeline from Russia for pretty cheap. Um, and now that's cut off and there's this cost of living crisis in Europe where people can't heat their homes. You know, all these different um, sectors of the economy are on strike. All these different groups of workers are on strike, including nurses and ambulance workers attached to the NHS. And then, you know, Britain is cutting NHS funding so they can, you know, create more weapons and send them to Ukraine um, at the behest of the U.S. and NATO. And Philip DeFranco, who I was mentioning earlier, one of the biggest news accounts on TikTok, uh, just posted a video today saying that the U.S. was um, saying the U.K. now is a second rate military. It's no longer a first rate military. Um, and, you know, if you look behind the scenes, you know, that's just the U.S. saying don't cave to these strikes. Don't cave to the nurses and the workers in your country who want you to do something for them and spend money on them instead of, you know, uh, this U.S. proxy war in Ukraine. Don't listen to them. You know, keep cutting the NHS uh, and, and boosting military spending and doing what NATO wants um, rather than doing what's best for the interests of your people, which in, you know, West and even most of East Europe has largely been going along with this and largely going along with, you know, what NATO pressures them to do and, um, yeah, it's <clears throat> not ideal. Um, we're kind of seeing the U S and all the forces, you know, the pro capitalist forces coalescing against the, um, rising countries in the East or the rise of multipolarity. But, um, we have a super chat, Carl, I, unless you have anything you want to interject right away. Yeah. And, uh, just real quick, uh, it's yeah. important to know where these, these journalists who have been able to break out the big stories like Seymour Hersh and uh, Glenn Greenwald, where is it that they're writing? Are they writing for the New York Times? Are they writing for these massive um, uh, liberal newspapers? Where are they writing? You know, they're writing in Substack. And that's how bad the mainstream media has gotten where any journalist worth a lick has to literally open their own Substack account or go into one of these, you know, anti-imperialist, smaller and shadow banned um, news network in order to write their work, uh, you know. So I think part of the fact that he, the the only place he probably was able to publish it was on a Substack is something meaningful. Has something meaningful 
to say about the, the state of journalism in the U.S. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, perhaps the title is misleading. It's not just the U.S. The U.S. was the driving force, but uh, Norway was a, was a key player in this too because Norway also has financial interests tied to blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline because the, Norg the Norwegians, um, as, as Hirsch uh, mentioned, uh, would be able to sell uh, uh, vastly more oil to Europe with that pipeline gone. And one of the key figures uh, in, in terms of Norway that was involved in this, his name is Jens uh, Stoltenberg. He was a supreme commander of NATO and a committed anti-communist for most of his life. And he served for as Norway's prime minister for eight years. And he was one of the key players that the U.S. Uh, used uh, throughout these operations. But, you know, uh, again, uh, I think something else that could be said was just, I guess, the messiness of these covert operations. It used to be the case that, you know, the U.S. would do uh, these covert things that obviously violated uh, international law, and it would be able to at least be kept hidden for a few years. Um, but, you know, the, the American ruling class is so um, it, it, it's so decrepit. It's, it, it's the state of American politics is so bad that even its covert operations are blurted out into the open before they could even be done. You know, we've We've known that something like this was potentially going to happen, uh, you know, at least six months before uh, it happened. Uh, so it's, you know, it's got something to say about the decrepit and moribund state of, of the U.S. empire as well. Absolutely. Simultaneously with the balloon story. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much to, for this uh, $20 super chat here. Um, says, you guys are an inspiration. I can't wait to see where your content goes. Thank you. Um, our content will keep getting better um, thanks to supporters like you. Um, so thank you so much for that. Our content wouldn't be possible without that. Um, a friend and I work on Prop Experimental Films, and we would love to help you with any of your editing needs. Wow, yes, we should definitely get in contact. Um, that's the number one thing that we need help with. Um, for the most part, is editing. Um, that's cool you guys work on experimental film, fellas. For whatever reason, yesterday, just doing a little bit of research on, like, Soviet films and, you know, why the government was so interested in film and, you know, that medium of communication. Because um, they knew they could communicate through film these, like, universal ideas, um, these universal uh, or ideas like uh, class struggle, you know, and, you know, some of the, the negative effects of capitalism can be communicated through a film in a really universal way or a way that affects people emotionally. So the Soviet government was really interested in it for that reason. Um, so cool to hear that you're involved with something like that. Honestly, when I was thinking about it, I'm like, we need more of that, you know, more like socialist um, artwork that reaches people. Um, on an emotional level, um, in addition to people like us who just talk at you, you know. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Do you have anything to add? We to also that? just received a super chat from GQ. He says, uh, what do you think of Westerners who flee capitalism to live in cheaper developing countries like Vietnam and Argentina? I have uh, mixed feelings. I would say that I have uh, mixed uh, feelings as as well, but um, you know I, I think it's usually younger folks that are, are doing this. People specifically uh, bogged down by like student loans or other types of uh, debt, uh, slavery that they've uh, had to accrue in order to get by in the U.S. And um, you know, insofar as they're uh, productive uh, citizens um, or residents in other countries, I, I don't really see a problem with that. Um, I think it's you know one of the uh, one of the positives in doing that, especially with countries like Vietnam or, or China, I know it's being done a lot with China, um, specifically China, because you can save uh, so much because from your paycheck, since your rent is so, uh, uh, so such a small portion of your, of your paycheck. I've, I've heard that if you make minimum wage, your rent could be as low as, as, as 30% of your paycheck, maybe a little bit higher. But uh, what effectively that means is that regular working class people have the capacity to, to accumulate. Um, and for foreigners, that's something very attractive, especially those coming from the U.S., because they can accumulate over the years enough money to pay off loans in a way in which they wouldn't be able to do so if they were in the U.S. Um, so 
And, you know, one of the side effects of that is that they're able to experience a difference in society from American predatory financial neoliberal capitalist imperialism to to uh, to China. And, and, you know, a lot of them get to China uh, without any political uh, ideology or, or just with a basic neutral American political ideology. And they end up changing their mind about socialism and uh, they end up doing, you know, uh, video vlogs and, and all these sorts of things that help Americans break down some of the dogmas that they've been force-fed to believe about socialism and about their own country. So I think there's definitely a positive uh, side to these things. Yeah, absolutely. I can comment on it from a little bit of a different angle just because of something I randomly stumbled into the other day. But there are also cultural reasons for this. Um, like there's a, there's a trend now on TikTok, and this is a little weird. Um, but this is a real thing that's going on. There's a group of guys that are calling themselves passport bros, um, meaning they're bragging about getting their passport and being able to leave to another country. Um, but there, it's like this anti-woke red pill type deal where they're saying that women in the U.S. are um, too independent um, and too career driven, really, which is actually pretty interesting um, versus in countries like China or Vietnam. Um, they feel that the women are more committed to certain gender roles and then um, are, are less, you know, focused on their career uh, and more focused on family life or whatever like that. So that was interesting. I saw that was a thing on TikTok and it was getting hundreds of thousands of likes and views. So you know, I have no opinion on it or no comment on it, but it's an interesting to, thing to observe um, and see that it exists. So, passport bros are gross. Yeah, that's that was my main takeaway. But because <laughs> a lot of them were just coming at it from a real seemingly misogynistic <laughs> angle. But yeah, do we want to turn towards the uh, second segment? Do you want to cover the? A AOC uh, video real quick. I think it would. Yes, uh, dude, let's do with, that. I didn't even with, watch it till like a lot. Like I didn't watch it. Then I saw RBN covering it and I was like, okay, I got to see this actual video. And then I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I saw it's RBN's so coverage of it. It's, and, so, yeah. it's yeah, just like RBN so, and fake. so fake. Yeah. Sorry. I, I think that... Uh, but it's telling of the larger state of the left. And if you compare it with some of the comments that AOC said early on when before she uh, got elected or in the first few days after she got elected, um, it's telling of this sort of explicit shift towards identity politics that these quote unquote progressives within the Democratic Party have taken. So um, I, I think it's very, very much symbolic of larger trends on the left that divorce themselves from, you know, working class politics and class struggle and uh, end up embarking in a form of class politics that's, you know, a class politics of the PMC and of stratas of the U.S. Uh, society that are very much in line with the living of empire. Yeah, let's watch the video in case people haven't seen it. I'm sure a lot of you have already, but... Um, this is AOC after Ilhan Omar was removed from some foreign policy committee in Congress um, for supposed anti-Semitic remarks, which we all know is, you know, just her standing up to Israel in the Israeli apartheid state that's been murdering Palestinians and forcing them out of their homes for years um, for 75 percent of the Palestinian people into refugee status. Um, so, but this is the, the Foreign Affairs Committee, by the way. Foreign Affairs Committee. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as also as a fellow New Yorker, I think one of the things that we should talk about here is also one of the disgusting legacies after 9-11 has been the targeting and racism against Muslim Americans throughout the United States of America. And this is an extension of that legacy. Consistency, there is nothing consistent with the Republican Party's continued attack except for the racism and incitement of violence against women of color in this body. I had a member of the Republican caucus threaten my life and you all and the Republican caucus rewarded him with one of the most prestigious committee assignments 
in this Congress. Don't tell me this is about consistency. Don't tell me that this is about an abdi a, a condemnation of anti-Semitic remarks when you have a member of the Republican caucus who, have, who has talked about Jewish space lasers and, and an entire amount of tropes and also elevated her to some of the highest committee assignments in this body. This is about targeting women of color in the, in the United States of America. Don't tell me because I didn't get a single apology. Time has expired. My life was threatened. Thank you. Ah, oh, I can barely do it. Although, I'll let you go ahead. Um, I just want to say real quick, because I brought it up before I played the video. The reason they're targeting Ilhan Omar is because she's critical of Israel. Because she's critical of the Israeli apartheid state, right? Islam, she has been targeted for being a Muslim woman plenty of times, right? But last time she was primaried by the Republican Party, she ran against a, another woman of color who happened to be a Republican. Right. So in this case, that is not why she is being targeted. Right. Because of um, her religion or the color of her skin or whatever. It's because of her politics, because of her anti-imperialist socialist um, position on that issue um, against the Israeli apartheid state that gets three three billion dollars plus a year from the um, U.S. military industrial complex. Right. Um, uh, it's important to mention that uh, it's kind of strange because. They're saying that they kicked her out because she's a, a Muslim woman of color, but the, the person that the Republicans have put forward was a Somali woman of color. So, you know, the, the, this logic of identity politics, it's so uh, strange and, and circular and self-defeating because in a way the accusations against Ilham Omar, although a form of, of class warfare against some genuinely anti-imperialist positions that she held and, you know, has... Um, as of late, uh, from what I've seen, somewhat uh, backstep. But um, it, in, instead of just coming out and, and saying uh, the obvious, which is that, you know, we want to defend Israel as a neo-colonial outpost um, in, in the Middle East, they can't say that. So they themselves, you know, reduce these attacks to identity politics and, and go on the, the same form of attacks that were waged against Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. You know, accusations of anti-Semitism, and instead of moving beyond identity politics and and using this large platform that that she's given here to talk about the Palestinian struggle, to talk about the Israeli apartheid state, and to defend the statements that Ilham Omar made, instead of doing that, she uh, stays within the field of identity politics and you know reduces the attacks on Ilham Omar to to her identity. And that's, that's, that's very sad because, you know, it ends up uh, reducing argumentation uh, to the identity of, of the person. You, you can't critique someone um, for, for the substance of their arguments without them retaliating and saying that, no, you, your, your, your real reason for critiquing me is, you know, my skin color or, or my uh, religion or my sex or something like that. And you know, that's that's just not how the left has rolled in the past when it's genuine racism. You know, you you call it out and you criticize it. But um, the reality here is that, it, you know, it's not racism on the part of the GOP, which is a it is a racist. But, you know, the DNC is also racist, but it's not racism that's at stake here. It's uh, the position that Israel holds as a neocolonial imperialist outpost of, of the U.S., which is at stake. Um, so it's. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this, the style. I mean, you said it's um, this speech is telling of trends within the Democratic Party and of the pseudo left. I mean, one of those things is that it's just total style over substance, you know, and the style kind of made me cringe too. But um, there's a lot of hand motions, there's a lot of jumping around. It almost looks like she's mimicking like a Baptist preacher. Um, right. like she's That's trying true. to do her best MLK impression. Um, when the speech is, you know, misses the main, main substance, the main substance, substantive point that she should make, which is that Ilhan Omar is being kicked out of a position of, um, of power um, when it comes to foreign policy because she's critical of Israel, who the UN, you know, has ruled as, as an apartheid state at this point. So it's undeniable. Um, but instead of talking about that, it's the identity politics combined with a lot of gyrating and jumping around. And the only real substantive point that she makes is attacking the Republicans. 
saying, how can you talk about, you know, anti-Semitism when you have uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about Jewish space, space lasers, which is a good point. But that's another trend in the Democratic Party. The only time they have a good point is when they're criticizing the Republicans, when they're talking about how bad the Republicans are. And it's like, we know that they're bad, you know, but you have to be better. You have to offer an alternative. You know, if you um, take, have the same policies as the Republicans and fight for the same things as them, then you're no better than them. Right, especially these people that were supposedly elected to be progressives and challengers of the right. the center um, and the mainstream form of politics within the Democratic Party, and um, you know, I think if if uh, if if anything has shown that that's not the case is is this uh, recent vote on on uh, prohibiting the rail strike, which of course AOC voted uh, in favor of, and uh, also remember that she voted. Uh, a, she she didn't vote against the bill that wanted to send three billion dollars to to Israel to to build the Iron Dome. Uh, so <laughs> again, you know nothing um, nothing strange here. Her voting shows that uh, you know might, while she might pretend to be an ally of of the Palestinian struggle, when it really counts, she's not there for Palestinian people or for working class people in the U.S. or, or really for for any of the progressive forces that. Uh, she claims to represent through her appeals to her personal identity and the identity of those around her. Absolutely. It's crazy how quickly her grift evolved into liberalism. Like, especially, I mean, now I guess I would expect that, but back then I like donated to her campaign when she got elected. I told all my friends like, this is a big deal. You know, this is America moving in a more compassionate, empathetic direction where the politics that makes more sense and I was just amazed when forced the vote happened, you know, when she got exposed on that level, um, how quickly she was trying to ally with Nancy Pelosi. And it's like, what, what, what are you doing? You know, no, not Nancy Pelosi. Like any anybody who allies with Nancy Pelosi is a neoliberal and is not a friend of the working class. Is that not obvious? Was that not what you campaigned on? Um, but she cozied right up to those establishment Democrats. And then, you know, quickly her identity politics became um, a way to criticize or um, slap down any critique from the left, you know, any critique about her, um, her foreign policy, her support for imperialism, things like this, you know, um, she's perfectly happy to weaponize identity politics to shut those critiques down. And it's, you know, the same thing liberal Democrats all do. Um, and, you know, she's doing the same thing social Democrats do um, or that they have done historically in sending a bunch of arms and weapons to, to Nazis in Ukraine, um, which is allying with the fascists at times of capitalist crises rather than the, the working class. Um, so, yeah, I guess we shouldn't be surprised if we look historically. But, you know, for those of us who came to the left through the Bernie mo movement and had real hope for AOC. It's been pretty shocking to watch, but a great example. And, you know, the like learn, learn lessons from this, right? If you put your faith in AOC and now you see what she's become, learn that lesson. Don't let it happen again, right? Don't put all your, your eggs in the electoral basket anymore. Um, that's what Norman Finkelstein was saying when he was talking about this um, AOC speech with Brianna Joy Gray on the Bad Faith podcast. Um, like we need to learn lessons from this. And then you have people like the majority port, Sam Cedar and, you know, the young Turks and a lot of these more, you know, neoliberal um, outlets or, you know, social democratic center left outlets, whatever you want to call them, who uh, just excuse everything the squad does, you know, and, and act as apologists for everything they do because, you know, they're supposed to be the left. Um, and, we, you can't do that if you want to have a successful movement, right? You have to have a real materialist analysis, understand they're not doing anything for the, the class struggle or for the anti-imperialist struggle. And what lessons do we learn from that moving forward? Uh, we learn that we need revolutionary socialism, um, not a bunch of social democratic um, politicians with a lot of rhetoric, but not a lot of fight. Right. And uh, it, it's not like participating in elections is like unimportant. You know, we have a population that pretty much treats elections as, as sports. And, you know, that's a 
a very incorrect way to, to treat it. But nonetheless, um, th there's a heavy emphasis on, on election. It's um, in part, you know, an important uh, part of the identity of a big chunk of Americans. That's not to say that, you know, overwhelmingly the vast majority of Americans are not as tuned into politics as the mainstream media thinks they are but um it's important to to participate in electoral politics but you know to, to what extent is it beneficial to participate um in a, in in a party that is a bourgeois uh imperialist party that uh, you know one can make the argument that is as fascistic if not even more than uh the republican party and you know, to, to, to what extent is participating in what they consider to be socialist politics in those conditions uh, be beneficial? You know, because um, if uh, if you recognize that you're dealing with a state structure that's intended to defend the interests of the capitalist class uh, and that uh, you still have to participate in elections, you should participate in elections so that you can be open to criticizing all parts of the ruling class and the policies that they take and connect, you know, everything that's going on uh, to everything else and connect it to the fact that these are all systemic, uh, systemically rooted. Um, and you can't do that uh, when you take this path within the Democratic Party. So if if they genuinely are interested in socialist politics, there, there has to be um, a, a way to approach things from a, a third party uh, a, a approach that actually gives you the freedom to criticize. Because, you know, one of the, the main things that uh, apologists of AOC and of this progressive wing still continue to say is that, oh, you know, they can at least win some uh, things within the Democratic Party. But it's, you know, what, what things? <laughs> they never point to concrete examples. You know, what things have they actually won? What things have they actually fought for? What things have they actually had, you know, the balls to, to stand there and criticize about their own party? You know, they, they're very harsh about this other party, but they got into those positions through grassroots, somewhat progressive movements that felt like they were going against the, the stream of, main, of, of U.S., uh, you know, the, the politics that's just, you know, that, that ends up having the Democrats and the Republicans function as, as two sides of the same coin. So what what have they concretely done for the movement for socialism? And, you know, the clear response has been nothing. Um, so. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Um, overall, do you have anything else on the AOC? Um, mean, not really. Uh, there's uh, someone in the chat that wants to ask yeah. a question dialectics i think they're dividing it into into two parts um uh, do you think that language of dialectics at this point is obsolete and it's no. the Sorry 19th uh, century and can make grasping concepts difficult um i think that there's a way to formulate dialectics which um while not making it uh, dialectics itself obsolete or the concepts obsolete make it more difficult for people to understand what is being said um, but i do think that the concepts are are important because you know what what you have with a, a concept is a phenomenon that exists objectively in reality and then we depict that concept in, in thought um verbally or, or in a written form through a term so the terms might seem unfamiliar to folks but it's it's really just a matter of familiarizing yourself with those terms. It might be the case that if you use a more familiar term, there's a larger disconnect between what's interpreted with the term and the actual concept. So I think that, um, I know, you know, you're referring to my text. I, I think that uh, personally the, the terms uh, used uh, were uh, those which I think best are able to connect uh, to the concept that uh, is, tr is attempting to be explained. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I try to do in that, in that book is, you know, explain in a comprehensive manner dialectics, uh, something which is made so obscure uh, by professional philosophers in a way that most people can understand it. So um, I get that there's still parts of it that might seem unfamiliar to the to a full novice, um, but 
you know, the, the part of this project is somewhat uh, comprehensive. You know, you're engaging with our videos now, and I've tried to do a bunch of different videos and interviews and segments where I break down even further some of the things that I that I write in that introduction. But um, I my my fear with uh, with going any simpler is uh, moving away from truth, and that's something that. Uh, we don't want to do for the sake of simplicity. We want to be as clear as possible so that everyone understands things, but we don't want uh, clarity to uh, move us uh, steps away from, from truth. And I think there's a second part of the question. There was a discussion of systems theories concept being better able to describe the concepts of dialectics. What is your opinion on that? And does dialectic need to be updated? Yeah, I... I mean, dialectics is, uh, it's an enterprise that is constantly uh, self-updating in a way, you know, part of uh, one of the things that I do is, is mention how Mao updates uh, these traditional categories of, of how we think about the different laws of change and interconnection. And um, I would say that there's constantly dialectical categories that are developing out of this more comprehensive framework to um, help explain the results of a more concretized uh, understanding of the world. So for instance, in China, one of the categories that has been recently developed that I've been able to engage with after publishing that book is partial qualitative transformation, which is, I think, a good way to describe uh, stages within one mode of production. So it, it'd be wrong to say that the transition from competitive to monopoly capitalism is simply a quantitative transition. You know, we want to hold that there's a stage that develops, but we don't want to say it's a qualitative change because we want to reserve qualitative change for descriptions of uh, transitions from one mode of production into another. But there is this change that's somewhere in between uh, quantitative and, 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 and purely qualitative. And the concept that the Chinese have came up for that is partial qualitative change. Now that's a new dialectical concept that, you know, it wasn't in Hegel, it wasn't in Marx, it wasn't in, in Engels, Lenin, and Mao. It's a new dialectical concept that allows us to comprehend reality in a more concrete fashion. And it deals with similar themes that were present in, in the past and allows us to uh, uh, retroactively look back at past texts in a more concrete manner. So there's obviously a lot of room for, for expanding on, on the sort of framework of dialectics. But I, I think the basic concepts are correct and shouldn't be substituted. For instance, I use the, I bring up the concept of emergence, which has been developed in the science, in the sciences, uh, as one of these concepts that um, basically depicts some of the central laws that are described in dialectics. I'm not against using uh, emergence as a concept to describe change and interconnection and the role that, uh, that new qualities, uh, the, the role that holes play in allowing new qualities to arise that are not reducible to the uh, to, to the bringing together of all the parts. Um, so, you know, I give the example of the ant colony. I give the example of capitalist production. Uh, so those are new terms that come about in the sciences that I think are positive to include within the the, the jargon of dialectic. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> We're here to do that, that one. So. <laughs> uh, oh. No, that was good. Uh, I like the I like the idea of different stages before a qualitative shift because I always had that question too with um, imperialism as a stage of capitalism. Like how many stages right. are there? Then you know what is a stage? Does that you know? constitute a qualitative shift or not so yeah it's a good um it's a theory right. about change so obviously with change you're going to get more concepts um right i consider you know my concept of the purity fetish to be you know a development that's out of this tradition um it's both new as a concept um but it's, it's new in a way that contains a lot of old things, like Michael Parenti talked about pure socialism. Lenin criticizes Kautsky 
for demanding purity out of motive, modes of productions that never exist in purity. You know, I, I source a lot of, uh, uh, from a lot of work in this Marxist Leninist tradition. I mean, it's a new concept, but it's uh, a new, unique way of formulating something that was already kind of grasped, but without the concept already uh, in the past. Yeah, and it's specific to the West. I mean, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be. I guess anyone could fall into purity fetishism, but really it's a phenomena that's super prominent in the Western sure. left. Um, so, you know, there haven't been a lot of super prominent Marxist theorists in the West. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, analysis and application, um, of Marxism to our conditions that needs to be done. Um, so yeah, it's one of the things I really like about that concept that, and it's just really accurate, um, in describing, you know, the trends that a lot of Western leftists repeatedly fall into. Um, did you want to do the Christian Parenti diversity video next or the Bill Maher woke revolution that with a bunch of butts? I think that they both deal with a similar uh, concept. Let's go with Bill Maher because I think it's more directly related to the AOC. And then okay. we'll, we'll finish it off with uh, Christian Parenti, Good which job. we hope to get on a segment uh, pretty soon to do an interview, perhaps about that same article. Yeah. Yeah, one of my buddies has his number actually. I should talk about that. All righty. Of revolutions where they spin out of control because uh, you restart it. So drunk on. Yeah, restart it. Yeah, restart it. And finally, new rule, if you're part of today's woke revolution, you need to study the part of revolutions where they spin out of control because the revolutionaries get so drunk on their own purifying elixir, they imagine they can reinvent the very nature of human beings. <laughs> communists, communists thought selfishness, selfishness could be cast out of human nature, Russian revolutionaries. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's already a lot uh, going on that, that should be broken down. First of all, he, he's treating like woke revolution as if it's something that's uh, grassroots um, when it's not. You know, what we've seen over the last four or five years, a phenomenon we describe as wokeism or woke washing. Um, I know there's people that, you know, they might not like the term, but they agree with the concept and, you know, criticize it in their own way. Um, you know, I know RBN calls it like the boutique left and the way that the boutique left approaches things. But, you know, what we've seen is consistently an approach from both capitalism and imperialism that uses the symbols, the language, the hashtags, the, the discourse, the, uh, the, the, the ways of presenting oneself from uh, these uh, at some point, grassroots struggles of marginalized communities and oppressed groups, and uses these at the service of imperialism, at the service of capitalism. And it's very much embedded in uh, playing on the sentimentality of the mass of people which have come to accept that racism is wrong, that sexism, sexism is wrong, you know, that oppression of minorities is wrong, that have come to accept these, you know, positive uh, things that people should accept but they play on those uh, sentiments in order to uh, manufacture consent at home for, you know, a, 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 uh, a progressively presented capitalism that paints emancipation and liberation of oppressed and marginalized communities as the diversification of, 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 of faces in high places, as if, you know, the only problem that the U.S. has is that, you know, it isn't the case that 13% of billionaires are black, you know, or that, you know, however, whatever percent of the population is LGBTQ, that that's not represented in the amount of the top uh, 1%. You know, that's what it paints as as liberation. And, you know, that is itself something that you have to attack or take the case of, you know, how they approach legitimizing their imperialist attacks on Venezuela, Cuba, China. China, well, they always emphasize the minority component of the, the, the Uyghurs, that are being, uh, you know, genocided, which again, it's all made up, but part of 
the narrative that strikes the liberal population is the fact that they're minority, a Muslim minority. In Cuba, when they wanted to row, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, war drums against Cuba in 2021, July 2021, they talked about how Cuba was oppressing black artists and 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 brown artists and 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 brown singers and it leaves out the fact very conveniently that these folks were taking money from the NED and from the State Department and from the CIA and then when they would come to Florida they would meet with Trump and with DeSantis and the more far right elements of, of US politics you know in Venezuela it emphasizes you know anti LGBTQ policies in Venezuela it does it with Russia it does it with any country that's outside of the sphere of influence of empire it uses the sentimentality of the population in order to promote imperialism in a woke manner. And we call it wokeism because it's been playing a systematic role in the imperialist narrative over the last at least five years or so. So to, to sit here and talk about a woke revolution as if it's something that's grassroots and not you know very much top down and used by capitalist imperialism to further its interests is completely wrong. You want to say something about that before we go into the second part of his comment about human nature which it's oh, it's infuriating yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely i just wanted to say like china did kind of change human nature um with their revolution like you can or the the nature of their people's lives which then in turn you know changes human nature changes the the cultural superstructure and you can say what you want about the cultural revolution and the attempt to you know change culture along with changing the mode of production but like there were cultural practices in China prior to the revolution, like foot binding, you know, where women's feet would be bound up really tight to make this like curved hook. Um, and that was gotten rid of by the revolution. There was like the Dalai Lama in Tibet, um, the dominant feudal landlord who would gouge out the eyes of his slaves if they disobeyed him or didn't meet the quotas or work hard enough. Um, and there were, you know, other versions of Dalai Lama, other feudal landlords all over China, you know, many of whom were famously killed after the revolution because of the brutality and the torture um, that they had um, put on the peasants for so many years. Um, and now, you know, if you watch our video about the construction of modern China, they've managed to industrialize and become a modern, you know, very wealthy country who's actually um, accomplished the incredible task that no other country in the world has accomplished of abolishing relative poverty. Um, so to to act like that didn't change the nature of people's lives or change, you know, quote unquote, human nature in China is absurd. Of course it did. The revolution changed people's lives for the better massively, um, which is why the U.S. has been throwing a tantrum about it pretty much ever since. Um, but yeah, easy for Bill Maher to just dismiss the gains of the revolution, though, when he's had a pampered position within the U.S. ruling class, um, spewing his uh, liberal and neoliberal talking points on television for the last 30 years or whatever. Oh, and thank you for the super chat, by the way, comrade. Yes, comrade. Thank you. Um, yeah, the yeah, the bourgeoisie loves talking about human nature, um, and it's a pure abstraction. Uh, what's the, it's, you know, to imagine that uh, how a human being was in the feudal era is the same as how a human being was at the beginning of capitalism and then the same as, as a human being today and the same as a human being in, you know, a hundred years and hopefully the, we have a global socialist uh, uh, world. You know, it's just completely absurd. Um, and, you know, there might be very small common elements, but, um, you know, it, it's the, the human being as, as a universal category in order to exist has to, as every other universal, concretize itself in the particular. This is, you know, without understanding dialectics, people cannot understand this. This is the dialectic of the universal in the particular. The way that the bourgeoisie treats these concepts which are universal is as abstract universal in a way that's divorced from history, in a way that's divorced from context, from time and place. The way that the Marxists and you know the, the Hegelians as well, the good Hegelians, treat universals is as concrete universals. Universals, if not incarnated in history in a specific time and place, do not exist. They are, you know, as Hegel would say, empty universals. They're abstract universals. And so, you know, the, the question the question of human nature is a a question which requires a 
historical response. What's human nature under capitalism? Which means what, th that the nature, the essence of the human being is defined socially. There might be these very basic abstract components that on their own are empty and meaningless, but those abstract components take form, they take shape uh, within uh, different historical circumstances. So the human being under capitalism, a cutthroat capitalism as the one that we have, is obviously going to have certain inclinations towards greed. That's all they grow up with. A human uh, being uh, under socialism taught that, you know, the purpose of work is to help the community is obviously going to have different inclinations. And we've seen that in, we, we've seen that uh, at, at play in Cuba. You know, the vast majority of Cubans are still in Cuba. They work not for the gain that their personal uh, work makes them, but because of the fact that it helps the, the revolution and it helps their brothers and sisters on the island or the uh, internationalist missions that are done by the doctors that are not for their own lucrative gain, they're done for the sake of humanity and, and, and to further the revolution. So to talk about human nature, that's an abstraction. Human nature is defined socially. And uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's something that the ability to talk about human nature in general is something that develops with capitalism. Once you have a mode of production that expands throughout the whole world, then it can fancy itself uh, with these sorts of abstractions uh, about humans in general, but um, there's yeah. not a truth to it. No, I mean, if you read Engels' origins, you know that humans way back when had group marriage. <clears throat> so you and your, your sisters, or, you know, a woman and her sisters would be married to a group of, um, a group of brothers, not related, but, um, um, and, you know, you would just like, live that way and keep the household together and um so to act like you know that human nature can be universalized and act like human nature was the same thing throughout every epoch of history in every mode of production is absurd you can look at the way humans li have lived um in any time period and it's greatly different and that greatly affects the psychology of people and how they live how they keep their house um every aspect of, of people's lives um, is different in, in different modes of production um, for the most part. So, yeah. And if you, if, you, if you take the approach, which I don't think it's fully correct, but if you take the approach that you're going to look at the characteristics of humanity f that have been present in, uh, m in, in the most time in, in human history, um, cooperation would be one of those uh, central characteristics. You know, ev evolutionary um, uh, theorists have held that, you know, the, the only reason why human beings have even come into existence as a species is that we were monkeys, that we were the, the weakest ones on, on the trees, and we were kicked out by other monkeys onto the land. And once we got to the land, the only way we can survive having other predators that were stronger than us, faster than us, they had, you know, things like claws that, that we didn't have. The only way we could survive was through cooperation, through labor, through the development of communication, through the development of planning. So the social and collective element has been in human communities for far longer than any of the, the greedy elements that really begin to develop once you have the development of class society, once uh, society produces because of how effective they have achieved uh, production thanks to historical development. Once they produce a surplus, a small class of people decide what to do with that surplus. And then that begins this sort of class fragmentation that just proliferates throughout history. And out of that class fragmentation, you know, you have the development of uh, emotional affects such as greed and, and these other different things. But uh, those are, again, historically constituted. But important thing is to say, you know, human beings are an abstraction that's concretized and uh, takes different form in the different uh, historical circumstances that they come to exist in. Yes, I think we've said that about 700 different ways. So. <laughs> Mary spoke of the new Soviet man who wasn't motivated by self-interest, but instead wanted to be part of a collective. No, it turns out he wanted to be on a yacht in a Gucci tracksuit holding a vodka and a prostitute. <laughs> Sorry, I got to stop it as we listen to the liberals cheering there. Woohoo! 
Yeah, why do 75% of Russians now want to return to the Soviet economic model? You know, the, the American liberals, again, living in comfort in the West, have such a comical, propagandized idea of what the fall of the Soviet Union was. They think everybody in Russia, you know, as soon as the Soviet Union fell, was on a yacht, you know, in a tracksuit. Um, just this American entertainment media stereotype of what a Russian person is. It was a human rights disaster. You know, they, had, they hadn't dealt with unemployment in years because everybody was employed by the state. Um, and they had their housing supplied by the state, their utilities. And all of a sudden, these things were ransacked by Western multinationals. And all of a sudden, people were thrown onto the streets for the first time. And there were people dying of starvation for the first time and prostitution. And um, the drug trade flowed over the border for the first time since 1917. Um, and, you know, which is largely why a lot of people want to return to a, an economic model similar to the Soviet Union. Because um, it threw everyone into such degradation. And, you know, there was a common saying at the time. Um, everything they told us about communism was a lie, but everything they told us about capitalism in the Soviet Union was true, you know, meaning maybe we didn't achieve this Soviet new man, you know, maybe we didn't achieve the ideal of our society, which, you know, um, socialism is a process of construction. It's not building a utopia overnight. Um, so, you know, we can understand why they didn't achieve this ideal society, especially being the first socialist experiment um, under tons of attack from imperialist aggression outside. But, um, um, but once the Soviet Union fell, even the people who were tricked by the bourgeoisie and who were tricked into um, dismantling their own socialist experiment um, in, you know, allowing capitalism and consumerism in, they said, oh, capitalism wasn't what we thought it was for the most part. You know, everything they told us about capitalism was true. It does put people in poverty. It does exploit people. It does leave people without security. Um, so, no, they didn't accomplish the, the creation of the new man, although there are, you know, examples of, um, quote unquote, human nature changing um, with the construction of socialism, as Carlos was saying earlier. Um, but to act like, you know, the, the fall of the Soviet Union brought freedom um, and wealth to that part of the world is a Western myth um, that's laughable. There's literally a term that political scientists have came up with, which is demodernization. The first time a country has demodernized and gone, you know, in terms of the most vital statistics that define a state, gone at least 100 years in time. And that's the result of, of the, the fall or the overthrow or, or the crumbling, whatever you want to call it, of the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, I, I love the way that these liberals approach things. It's so funny. They just take one fact, which is that, okay, there was a class of oligarchs that developed after the fall. Um, and and they say, here's my theory about human nature, and here it is proven. Um, it's so absolutely stupid. And, you know, it's, again, I'm, I'm sorry to, to be repetitive, but it's an absence uh, of, of dialectical thinking. Like, none of these facts exist isolated. There's a plethora of other facts that developed uh, conjoint with a million other facts into the fact that he's looking at. And he can't understand that fact that he's looking at if he doesn't look at it in the context of the factors that allowed it to be. And so, you know, it's uh, it's just absurd. And it's, it's an absurdity that's so common in the U.S. that you don't even have to defend anymore. True. Thank you, Carmen. Yep, thank you for the super chat, David. Really appreciate that. The OG Patreon. Not standing in line all day for a potato. <laughs> the problem with communism and with some very recent ideologies here at home is that they think you can change reality by screaming at it, that you can bend human nature by holding your breath. But that's the difference between reality and your mommy. <laughs> Lincoln once said that you can repeal all past history, but you still cannot repeal human nature. But he's canceled now, so fuck him. Lincoln also said labor is prior to and superior to capital. 
and should be given much the higher consideration. But yet we have capitalist stooges like Bill Maher giving us the news. So, um, and he was he was pen pals with Marx, mm -hmm. uh, very excited with Marx's support. He was looking forward to in some uh, later writings to uh, 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 to taking into account the question of wage slavery after chattel slavery was abolished. But no, Lincoln was a you know a, a, a liberal paradise according to this guy. Right. Yesterday, I asked Chat GPT, are there any similarities between today's woke revolution and Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s? And it wrote back, how long do you have? <laughs> because again, in China, we saw how a revolutionary thought he could do a page one rewrite of humans. <laughs> Mao ordered his citizens to throw off the four olds old thinking, old culture, old customs, and old habits. So, um, your whole... Again, in a lot of ways, they did. Like, what? talk about foot-binding, Bill Maher. Talk about the Dalai Lama slaves who had their eyes gouged out. Oh, wait, you don't know shit about that. You just have this typical American propagandized view um, of every existing socialist country... And you just repeat talking points as if that's analysis, which I guess is liberal analysis. But. The Southern slave owners thought it was human nature to have the white man enslave the black slave. Uh, so what the, I mean, with these arguments about human nature, you can pull anything out of your ass and defend it. It's just used as, as a card to defend whatever the existing state of affairs is life went in the garbage overnight. No biggie. And those who resisted were attacked by an army of purifiers called the Red Guard who went around the country putting dunce caps on people. Yeah. Who didn't take to being a new kind of mortal being. A lot of pointing and shaming went on. Oh, and about a million dead. And the only way to survive was to plead insanity for the crime of being insufficiently radical, then apologize and thank the state for the chance to see what a piece of shit you are. And of course, submit to re-education, or as we call it here in America, freshman orientation. <laughs> I like story. There's a law professor. I like how, um, at least he didn't say, you know, some of these more outrageous numbers, like 60 million. He kept it to a, to a decent 1 million dead, which is so incredibly stupid. Like if, you, <laughs> if you look at the statistics of uh, China, uh, even in its worst periods in the Great Leap Forward, the death rate wasn't any higher than the average death rate in these poor countries of the colonized South where people were dying at a higher rate because they had been kept systematically poor by colonialism. You know, it had nothing to do with the system. In fact, um, the system was what abolished that sort of condition. If you just compare China, and we're talking here about pre-78 China, before reform and opening up and before the miracle that that has been, you know, for China, um, even during the period of, of the pre-78 China, compare it with India. What do you find? You know, the, the living standard, the, the raising of the living um, life expectancy in China was quicker than it's ever been before in human history. It went from, I believe, 32, 33 years to 67. India's only went to 55. And India's was, you know, it was a pretty high rise. But, you know, Mao's China went up to 67. It was the quickest life uh, expectancy increase in the history of humanity. And that came conjoint with a bunch of other uh, raisings of living standards. Now, they you know, they clearly weren't enough, and there was still a lot of inequality between China and the developed world that was, uh, you know, destroyed with time or has been progressively destroyed with uh, the policy of reform and opening up. But the successes of that pre-78 period, uh, which, you know, the Chinese are very critical of still, have been tremendous. And, and to ignore that, is just to participate 
in in myth telling and not genuine historical uh, research. And it's got like the what the party was doing at that time. Um, and someone kind of said this in the chat, but it's nothing like what the woke movement is. You know, one, it was carried out by the the Communist Party, whereas the woke movement is more decentralized and kind of attached to the um, the Democratic Party in a way. <clears throat> um, but the main thing that um, the party was trying to do at the time, and if you read anything from Mao, this will be glaringly obvious, is consolidate support of the people. Consolidate support of the people by serving the people. Serve the people, meet the people's needs, be there for the people, and then the people will support the party and support the society that we're trying to build, um, which is just a society for itself, for its own benefit. Um, versus, you know, the woke movement is all about dividing the people. You know, it's all about placing people into more and more different groups um, and talking about how there can be no unifying class struggle. Um, you know, the class the working class needs to be divided up into more and more groups and there can be no uni true unity between these groups because uh, their subjective experiences are just too different. Um, it's the exact opposite ideology that Mao and the Communist Party were based on. That's an excellent point. And we're going to see that point really nicely hammered out with the, the next video from Christian Parenti. But yeah, you know, it's... Um, it's just so radically different. And again, if you view uh, what he calls the woke revolution from the angle that we do as something that has become, you know, maybe it wasn't at one point, but has become something that's very top down, something that's very much used uh, at the service of, of capitalist imperialism. To even think about comparing that with uh, the cultural revolution is just completely, completely absurd. Absolutely. Professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago, named Jason Kilborn, whose crime was that on one of his exams, he used a hypothetical case where a black female worker sued her employer for race and gender discrimination, alleging that managers had called her two slur words, the type of real world case these students might one day confront. And knowing the extreme sensitivity of today's students, he didn't write the two taboo words on the test, just the first letter of each. He was teaching his students how to fight racism in the place where it matters most, the criminal justice system. But because he merely alluded to those words, again, in the service of a good cause, he was banned from campus, placed on indefinite leave, and made to wear the dunce cap. <laughs> no, not really the dunce cap part, but, but our American version of that. Eight weeks of sensitivity training weekly 90-minute sessions with a diversity trainer and having to write five self-reflection papers. A grown-ass man, a liberal law professor. If you can't see the similarities between that and this, the person who need, needs re-education is you. It is interesting how Americans have... You know, there are things like corporate punishments or employer punishments that get passed down all the time. But Americans don't see that as authoritarian or dictatorial. It's only the things that, you know, our government has alleged against the Chinese government um, that are authoritarian. When we have the most authoritarian system of all, your boss is a dictator who owns your labor for the majority of your week, you know, and you spend all your time working under them and they're allowed to punish you and make you write papers and do whatever they did to this guy. And again, this is an example of um, wokeism um, breaking up uh, a struggle for legal justice. You know, someone who was trying to unify and teach people how to struggle against racial injustice in the legal system and this sort of cancel culture, woke ideology, whatever you want to call it, was used to break up that um, collective struggle. Um, so again, we see how it's not the same as uh, communist ideology or the um, theory of class struggle. And, um, you know, I, 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 I'm always more, I, I always marvel at the fact that these folks are able to take things that most people disagree with about capitalism. And then, uh, in order to critique it, they call it communism. <laughs> um, and you know, whether that's the libertarians with the state, right. Anything that the state does, uh, that, that, is evil 
we hate it. They fail to see that it's a capitalist state. They just call it socialism. Um, or whether it's with this, you know, one of the, the main ways that in the workplace, this woke ideology manifests itself is in, you know, human uh, uh, HR uh, departments and diversity, equity and inclusion departments crack, uh, cracking down on working people for, you know, very small things and just um, constantly surveilling working people. So, you know, this has, you know, been a development that capitalism has used to its advantage in order to crack down on workers even more. It's it's a phenomenon which has developed out of capitalism. And if, if you dislike some of its effects, don't go comparing it to, to communism. You know, look at its, its real sources. Its sources have been capitalism. The ends which it serves in this form at least are, are capitalism. Absolutely. You want to keep going with the Bill Maher video? Does he say anything else? This guy is so insufferable. I don't know. I haven't seen the video before, so I don't I don't know if he... <laughs> you want to move on to Parenti now? He is pretty hard to listen to. Yeah. We should also do the reactions at like 1.5. I think that's yeah. a good speed that yeah. most people would be able to, to catch it. You know, the other day I was on the phone with Tom and we were watching a video and I put it at uh, twice as fast and he... Uh, I heard the video perfectly, and I was like, "Oh, so what'd you think?" He's like, "I didn't hear anything. I couldn't yeah. understand what he said." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god!" Uh -huh. I trained myself to uh, to just listen to everything in twice. Have you ever been listening to something twice as fast, and then someone calls you, and you just want to tell them, "Like, can you talk faster? You're talking yeah. so god slow." Yeah, <laughs> so I do it all the time on my way to work. And I get to work, and I'm like, everyone's talking in slow mo. <laughs> Everything's um, in slow mo. Uh, let us know in the chat. I'll keep. I'll put it at 1.5 to start, and then if that's too fast, let me know. I'll go 1.25. But this is a really cool video that I actually I think I sent this to Carlos and Noah probably. Um, Christian Parenti video uh, where he's talking to Katie Halper, who's a real um, cool journalist or sort of news figure. Um, I think she's sort of like a liberal. Um, I'm not positive, but any, either way, she's pretty smart and pretty good at what she does. Um, and Parenti here is going to talk about diversity and say that diversity is a ruling class ideology, which is something that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers in academia. Um, something that's going to, you know, upset a lot of people and shock a lot of people, honestly. But as we were showing in the last video which was a really good video for carlos to pick before we watch this one um you know the sort of woke capitalism is the antithesis of class struggle um so the the way that the bourgeoisie uses diversity um diversity rhetoric and diversity ideology to break up class struggle is you know, imperative to understand in the modern day if we're going to put any kind of real <coughs> materialist working class struggle together. Um, so, yeah, you got anything to say about this video before we play it, Carlos? Um, no, thank you for sending it. There's a really good comment that just came in about Maurer. I don't know if we should leave it because uh, we're starting the other segment, but um yeah, it's I can I can see the video being somewhat uh, controversial, but I think that if we fail to criticize the developments in the liberal wing of capital, our um, critiques of the ruling class of Germany is going to be at best one-sided, and we want to avoid that. So keep your minds open, and if there's any parts that uh, that uh, go beyond where you feel comfortable, you know, um, you can uh, critique that, I guess, or something. But um, Always keep your mind open to, to criticizing the liberal wing of capital as well. You know, it's a very often it's just the, the right, but the left is also fundamental. Uh, the left wing of, of imperialism and, and of neoliberalism is always fundamental uh, for, for the project as a whole. So what made you write this piece in the first place? Well, one is just the, the, you know, the prevalence of uh, diversity as ideology, diversity ideology, uh, you know, Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo, this, this sort of stuff, it's everywhere and it's, it's in every workplace. So there's that element of it, but it's also uh, rereading Federalist 10, really reading it. I'd read it in college or something, but in writing the Hamilton book, I read it and it's an amazing document. 
because it's the ruling class saying the quiet part out loud. And it was written by James Madison. And Madison was one of the, like probably the most important driving force behind designing the Constitution. And the Constitution had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. And that ratification was actually not guaranteed. There was a lot of opposition to the Constitution because it created a, a very centralized and powerful state. And a lot of Americans felt, wait a minute, we, you know, we just threw all, we fought a war to get rid of such a state. And now they've, you know, a couple years after the fighting, there's this period of like interregnum where there's a different document serving as the, as the Constitution. It's called the Articles of Convention, um, uh, the Articles of Convention. I'm spacing out, it's early here in the morning. Confeder Articles of Confederation. And, um, you know, that left most power to the states, basically. And that leads to a crisis in the 1780s. And it's out of that crisis culminating in Shays' Rebellion, which is a class war by indebted farmers against the creditors who are bleeding them dry. And in response to that, they hold the Constitutional Convention and they create the Constitution, which creates a, a very centralized and powerful state. And a lot of people did not like that. And so ratification of the Constitution, which required a majority vote uh, in nine, you know, nine states had to pass the agreed to ratify the Constitution. And then all 13, all 13 states agreed that if nine of us ratify this, then we'll all go along with it. But it was not at all clear that nine states would ratify it. And so Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay got together and they wrote a series of essays, 85 essays in all, that are later known as the Federalist Papers. And each of these essays took on an argument against the Constitution, against ratification, and countered it and said, look, look, don't be concerned about that, blah, 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 blah. And so Madison in Federalist 10 addresses elites and he says, many fear that if we have political democracy, this will lead directly to economic democracy, that political democracy will lead to class leveling. And the ruling class, the property classes in those days had no compunction whatsoever of being open saying, we don't want that. Why would we do that? You, wait, 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 you, you, this is dangerous. You give like common laborers uh, uh, the right to speak, the right to assemble, uh, you know, vote even, um, run for office. No, this is crazy. It's going to lead to economic democracy. They're going to come for our wealth and try and redistribute it. And so Madison said, don't worry about that. That is not, that's not that big a risk. He says, the only, political democracy only threatens economic democracy if the majority of people who are effectively propertyless, get together and oppose those who own most of the property. He, he says it in those terms very, very explicitly. He says, look, society is, has forever been riven by faction. And faction has myriad sources. It can be, you know, religious belief, uh, adherence to some political leader, geography, right? There's all sorts of sources of faction, as he calls it. And faction would be translated into our modern language as like interests, interest group, right? And there's, there's infinite ways to sort of divide and define people's interests, right? And he said, the risk of faction is only if that majority faction gets together. If the majority of people who are poor or propertyless get together and oppose the minority who own everything. And he says, so the solution to preventing that is to lean into the problem of faction, to encourage faction, to encourage division among people, and to encourage a hypervarigation of interests. And I mean, that is essentially what modern diversity ideology does, is don't think of yourself as a worker, don't think of yourself as an employee. Think of yourself as a subset of that. You are a trans worker. You are a, a, a worker who's a woman. You are a person of color. And, and, and you should think in these subcategories and not in the more universal category of being a worker, being someone who does not have property, etc. Right. So, it's about so yeah, a lot there. Um, pretty interesting. Uh, you want to go first, Carlos? Um, <laughs> sure. Throw me the bomb. <laughs> Um, well, just something real quick. Uh, I don't know if the folks know, but um, the first uh, case of red baiting in the U.S. goes back to Madison uh, red baiting Thomas Jefferson and, and, and Payne and some of the more progressive factions of the uh, re revolutionaries, which supported the French Revolution and were called atheist and, and anarchist and uh, foreign agents by, by Madison. Uh, but it's interesting here to see in, in 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 Federalist Ten, uh, you know, the quiet part, as he says, said out loud, which is that divide and conquer. You know, keep people whose interests are fundamentally the uh, the same or quite similar. Keep them divided, uh, uh, proliferate, and and pick on divisions which are organically there, so that those get more and more pronounced, and keep them fighting with each other and. You know, the history of Cointelpro shows that that's one of the, the central things that the State Department has done to the left. Um, and, you know, it's it'd be pretty foolish to think that Cointelpro is, is is gone. You know, this is something that uh, is, is prevalent in, in social media and definitely embedded in this diversity culture, which um, it does something very strange. You know, anti-racism anti uh, in the communist movement 
took the form of a determinate form of class struggle. So like in Du Bois, you have something very interesting going on in like Black Reconstruction. The first chapter is dedicated to the black worker. And that's not done in this like, um, in this way that he's describing as diversity uh, politics that's just, you know, trying to divide and create a bunch of subcategories. It, it's done for the sake of unity. You know, the, the working class movement at the time they didn't consider uh, the black slave and the slave worker, they didn't consider them part uh, as a worker. And because they didn't consider them as a worker, they couldn't envision the idea of the working class movement in the North. And there, there wasn't really a working class movement in the South, but the working class movement in the North linking up with the abolitionist movement, with the movement of slaves. So by bringing forth the category of the black worker, it's not just an act of you know anti-racism, which is of course fundamental and and itself a form of class struggle, but it creates the conditions for a more unified form of class struggle. Now you can fight as a working class because you're recognizing the black worker as a worker, not just as this other you know, uh, slave uh, being that has nothing to do with my struggle. You're linking up struggles so that they can wage the struggles together and become, as Du Bois says, an irresistible force. It's the complete opposite nowadays with diversity ideology. Instead of linking the struggles against individual forms of super exploitation or oppression that are faced by specific groups of the working class, instead of linking those as a class struggle to the general struggle of labor against capital, those are intensified and driven to extremes where what matters is not the class element in it, but the representational element. And they get uh, embedded into this PMC and, and petty bourgeois form of, of politics that's really embedded in the iron triangle of the academia, the media, and the NGOs. And that's the sort of activism that comes out of that and that predominates today in the left. Absolutely. And I also find it interesting how the only time the ruling class or the, the advocates of this um, woke capitalism or diversity ideology, postmodernist ideology, whatever you want to call it, the only time they call for class unity is when it's like an act of imperialism, when they're talking about bringing women's rights to Afghanistan or, you know, supporting the feminist cause in Iran, which is actually just a U.S. regime change effort. Then they call for unity, right? They say, why don't you stand behind this, you know, movement for women's rights, which is actually, you know, uh, an imperialist movement that's been disguised or a regime change effort disguised as a movement for women's rights. But then they say... Um, you know, be an ally, be an ally to this movement, um, you cishet white males or whatever. Um, that's the only time they call for unity and unity behind, you know, um, uh, a woke movement, which is actually, like I said, a, a regime change project being being disguised or being made up. Um, <clears throat> other than that, yeah, it's just a way to cause division. Um, yeah, I guess we can keep watching the video unless you have more carlos i think a good example is police violence um you have a case where black people are disproportionately killed by police that is absolutely true and racism is a fundamental component uh in these killings and in and in the you know murderous and brutal and carnal activities of of the police departments but it's also the case that the vast majority of people that have been killed in the u.s by police have been white that's a fact you know, uh, but that's a fact that we don't talk about. Why don't we talk about that fact? Because then we will realize, as you know, scholars like Adolf Free Jr. have done, um, that the, the main component uh, behind this uh, murderous activity on the part of the state's armed bodies of men is class. They attack poor people, uh, but disproportionately. That's the most disproportionate group being attacked. Poor people, poor people being killed. But if you present that narrative in that way, then you create the grounds for multiracial working class solidarity. Then white people can identify their struggle against uh, capital and the state with the struggle of black people who are disproportionately killed with the struggle of brown people. And everyone can connect their struggles and realize that there's a common basis for their exploitation and oppression. And that the only way to throw off the yoke of their exploitation and oppression is by coming together and fighting collectively for that. So they can't do that. So they emphasize, you know, one part of the killings, which is, you know, you have to emphasize there are races and it's a disproportionate amount, but I've never seen in the news mention about the other statistic. And those are all human bodies also being murdered 
by armed by the armed bodies of men of the state. And that has, in my my view, in the last you know six seven years of activism that I've been doing, I've never seen that mentioned anywhere. And that's a fundamental fact that would create cross racial class solidarity in fighting against uh, police abuses, in fighting against the state, and fighting against capital. I mean, I would encourage people to actually read Adolf Reed's um, text on this or his essays on this because they're pretty short but concise. Um, and like Carlos was saying, he's never seen or he hasn't seen that many people make this point before, but he makes it so concisely and just lays out the statistics. Like here is the percentage that police are killing black people. You know, it's much higher than white people. Um, so clearly there's a racial element here. But here's the percentage that police are killing poor people versus rich people. And it's freaking astronomical. It's like almost all poor people and they never shoot rich people um, regardless of what color they are. Um, it's like rich black people are slightly more likely to be shot than rich white people. But a poor white person is still more likely to be shot than either of them. Um, <clears throat> and he just lays it out simply, tells it how it is. And at the time you know, it created a internet meltdown or created a meltdown amongst leftists, you know, who tried to cancel a, a black professor for um, giving his opinion or giving his analysis about police violence, um, which shows the absurdity. Um, like like the, the diversity advocates and the advocates of identity politics oftentimes end up canceling like a, a great black professor like Adolf Reed. They don't even end up, you know, or they don't even follow through on their own um, principles, supposed principles of um, treating uh, people with a certain skin color um, differently or with privilege or whatever. Um, so. Think about other aspects of your interests, of your self-interest, other than the economic aspect. So that's what that, that's what Federalist 10 argues is, is that's what we have to do is we have to proliferate faction. And if you do that, then you will make it impossible for the majority of the population to unite and wage. He doesn't say a class struggle, but that's what he's describing to, to wage a struggle about who owns what, who gets what. Did they just like political democracy, but not like economic democracy, like they were committed to political democracy or was it just strategic? Well, um, it was a bit of both. I mean, there were there were elites who. American elites who wanted enough democracy to push back against the control of the British crown, right? And so that's why there's a revolution. I mean, there's a revolution because there are enough different factions with enough different reasons that all make them want political democracy and freedom that they can get together on the basic question of like, let's get the Brits out of here and make our own laws. But then once that done, once that was done, then all the internal divisions come out. And, and most prominent among them is the class division. Um, and there's also the division around slavery. So there was, you know, different groups had different interests in democracy, right? And so the slaveocracy in the South, they're like, democracy for us means we locally here in South Carolina, we decide what we're going to do. Not everybody, property owners here in South Carolina decide what they're going to do. And that means that you abolitionists up north have no say. That's undemocratic. We, we control our business here. But then there was, you know, this rhetoric of freedom was very open and vague and all sorts of people grabbed onto it and filled it with their own meaning. So there was a, a very considerable working class, you know, popular class drive to the American Revolution. Workers heard freedom and like they interpreted it in their own ways. So everyone who fought you know, on the American side. And not all Americans did. There were plenty of loyalists who, were, who thought, this is crazy. You, you want to leave the largest empire in the world? Like, what? No. Um, so, but all the patriots, you know, all the revolutionaries had various readings and very, brought various meanings to what democracy would be. And this played out concretely around questions like the property qualifications to vote. And some states had property qualifications, some didn't. The U.S. Constitution, to its credit, does not include property qualifications. There's no racial uh, restrictions on voting or on office holding. There are no gender restrictions on voting. Um, so he said a lot of interesting things there, um, which now I'm kind of spacing on, um, unfortunately. Um, what the heck was I going to say? Save me, Carlos. Add some analysis while I recall what I was going to say. Um, well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of spacing too, but... Uh, it's late in the night, but one of the yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I I think it's important to um, it, it's just so refreshing the fact that he's referring to it as a revolution that's so rare to see on the left that it has uh, you know dogmatically accepted this this counter revolution thesis, which um, is not just a, in my view at least historically wrong, but um, uh, necessarily leads one 
Oh, that's what I wanted to say. The yeah, forms of national- horn. yeah, yeah. The forms of national nihilism, which I think are so prevalent uh, today. But um, yeah, it's it's. I haven't read Federalist Ten, but it's I, I'm I am going to read it because it is saying uh, things that are you know just so fundamental for the ruling class, divide and conquer. Like the the idea of race itself, the modern idea of race was completely fabricated. It was a fabrication of you know, of early stage capitalism uh, used for the sake of dividing working class people. And, you know, uh, one of the things that a, you know, run of the mill leftist might uh, respond is that, you know, by doing this, we are class reductionists or whatever. And the response to that would be that it's completely uh, wrong. Um, We do hold as Marxists, that class struggle is the engine of movement of history, that if you take away class struggle from Marxism, you don't have Marxism anymore. But it's important to remember that that phrase uh, is the history of all hit earth or existing societies is the history of class struggles. And it's plural because class struggles, again, as a universal, in order for them to exist, need to take uh, shape in the particular. They need to concretize itself in the particular and as Dominico Lasorda argues, there's no such thing as a pure class struggle. There's always different forms of class struggle. There's the, you know, the more traditional one between directly between capital and labor at the factories, at, at the place of production. But there's also national struggles for liberation, which are a form of class struggles. There's a struggle against racism as a form of class struggle. There's a struggle against patriarchy, which Engel says, you know, the first form of class struggles uh, is 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 the struggle uh, against uh, the patriarchy. Um, you know, it's one of the statements that he makes in the origins of the family, private property, and the state. And so the issue of like, you know, prioritizing class struggle, it isn't ignoring these other things, but uh, seeing those types of struggles through the lens of class struggle. And for instance, you couldn't develop a collective class struggle in the U.S. if one part of the working class, specifically in the South, it's so racist that it's literally fucking lynching another part of the working class. You know, are you supposed to come together and fight if you have two groups that are so hostile to one another that one is literally lynching the other one? And it's not just an event that, you know, the bad guys are just the lynchers. It's literally basically treated as a fucking picnic where people are coming, they're placing bets in order to take home body parts, they're taking their children, they're eating, you know, hot dogs and, and burgers. And, you know, it's, it's a fucking obscene, disgusting spectacle. And to think that you can wage a collective class struggle without tackling the question of racism and obliterating racism from the consciousness of the white working class in that context is just impossible. So the, the struggle against racism in that context is the form of class struggle, the form class struggle takes uh, as a determinate form of struggle. So, you know, Without dialectics, these people can see that when you talk about emphasizing class struggle, it doesn't mean you're ignoring these other things, but that you're looking at them from the angle of class struggle so that those struggles against racism and against sexism or, you know, whatever the case may be, don't be don't get reduced to what they are reduced now, which is that freedom for these groups is representing them in, in, in movies and in politics and, you know, having diverse faces in high places and you know, the places that continue to perpetuate an order which continues to exploit and oppress all sorts of different people around the world. Yeah, and Christian Parenti's got a skill similar to his dad um, of applying dialectics to history without even really saying what he's doing explicitly. But um, I remembered what I wanted to say earlier, other than pointing out the um, false theory of counter-revolution um, that uh, Gerald Horn puts out that um, Parenti here debunks and has been debunked by others like Anthony Montiero and uh, Marius Trotter. Um, but also these talking about how this idea of freedom, which often, you know, in, in the U.S. lore is used in the abstract or by the ruling class is used in the abstract. We have the most freedom, you know, but of course, freedom can't be universalized. Um, what does freedom mean? So he says that freedom starts to be particularized in all these different groups start latching on to the idea of freedom and saying, you know, what is our idea or what is our idea of freedom? And that usually tends to be based on their economic class. So you have the enslavers in the South saying freedom for us is we get to decide how to run our government. You have to leave us alone. 
right? We have our own state. We have our state's rights. We think that the slave owner should be able to decide what to do, and that's freedom. Then you have the patriots, you know, who say freedom is throwing off the, the British um, the British Empire and starting our own country. And um, all these different groups start to particularize um, and concretize for themselves what the idea of freedom is, um, which... Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no freedom, universal freedom, in the abstract. Uh oh, we might have lost Carlos. I think Carlos has passed. Oh, he said he has to go pee. Okay, we'll play a little bit more in the video. I'm about ready to fall asleep, to be honest. But we'll see how much longer Carlos wants to go when he gets back. Or an office holding, but a lot of powers were left to the states, and many states had property qualifications, and then also uh, excluded women and excluded people of color from voting. Interestingly, not all of them did that. That the whole, it's not like everything was oppressive and then it all slowly got better and better. There were actually states that, I mean, things were quite oppressive and you know, racist and sexist, but, but, but there were some surprises. Like in New Jersey, women had the right to vote if they, had prop, if they met the property qualifications. Um, and believe it or not, in South Carolina, African-Americans who met the property qualifications could vote. But that's then quickly, like after the revolution, that's quickly undone. And most states, not all have property qualifications. Now, not all those property qualifications were particularly onerous. Some property qualifications were, you know, it basically meant that, uh, you know, if you were, if you had, you know, if you owned a house or you had a wagon and you're self-employed, you could vote. It just meant that the, the true proletariat, the people who, you know, rented and had no tools, no business, they just sold their labor. They were the ones who were excluded from, from voting. But those were state laws. But anyway, I digress. But the point is why, you know, political democracy was an open, contested field. And so, like, part of what federalists, And this is interesting here because it's kind of relevant. Um, yes, example, the upcoming rage against the war machine protests in D.C. Um, on February 19th. Jimmy Dore is going, but some factions, Code Pink, Veterans Against War, threaten to not join because they claim some speakers aren't sufficiently pro-LGBTQ, etc. Class divides and rule. Those factions should prioritize class over identity politics. Yeah, there's a really good concrete example. You know, in this war, uh, anti-war rally, and we tweeted about this, you know, and saying, like, if you have people who you disagree with on other issues, but they are willing to agree with, you know, uh, to work with you in the anti-imperialist struggle, you got to come together for what's best. You got to put the class struggle first, the anti-imperialist struggle first, the struggle against capitalism first. Um, like... By example, the Libertarian Party, who even has, you know, a totally def different economic ideology as us, they're willing to collaborate in certain ways to fight against the new Cold War and the NATO proxy war in Ukraine. So, you know, we need to make those inroads when it's possible. Um, and the main thing is uniting people over class, you know, and, and like... Like Carlos was saying earlier, if there's bigotry, right, if there's actual bigotry and hatred for, you know, between different factions of the working class, um, that needs to be addressed. And, and fighting that battle, fighting against that is part of the class struggle. That's part of unifying the working class. Um, but in a situation like this, in a concrete situation like this, um, yeah, you got to unify um, with those speakers to put on a really good and a really big event that gets the... Um, gets the attention of the ruling class um, and, you know, for, for the time being, put your disagreements and, and differences aside a little bit. I think. I don't know if you have anything yeah. to say about that. I, I was sad that other uh, progressive forces didn't get uh, behind that. Um, it, what's interesting is that uh, some of those forces that failed to endorse that or that pulled back, they're perfectly fine with like real politique within the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, part of that real politique has been that even the, the most quote unquote progressive elements of the Democratic Party, people like Bernie Sanders, has recognized that in order, in order to get certain, um, certain uh, positive things passed, he's had to work with with people he heavily disagrees on, you know, ideologically uh, on 99% of things, but he's been able to realize that if I want to focus on passing this one sort of thing, I got to work with whoever agrees on that one thing. Um, and he's just, I believe, worked with uh, Ron Paul in the past and um, on anti-war issues. But uh, you know, one of the one of the 
trends that ends up developing, I think, with this diversity ideology, as Christian Parenti calls it, is the inability to even think in terms of uh, principle and non-principle contradiction. Everything is treated as a principle contradiction. Everything, even stuff that affects, you know, just 1% of the population, which, you know, it's not to, to call it unimportant, but everything is treated as a principle contradiction. And so if, if you have a group of people who disagree with one issue, which if you look at things objectively, it's not the principal contradiction, because you have a framework that everything is equally as important, you're not gonna work with that group of people. And I think the, the, the main thing that we have to focus on today is that we have a criminal ruling class that's edging us closer and closer to nuclear Armageddon. And if I have people, regardless of, of how kooky they are, that want to build and bring their mass base into an anti-war uh, movement, that creates not only one, the opportunity to take their working people who are anti-war into a correct anti-imperialist position, which is often, you know, forgotten that, you know, you bring people to socialism by convincing them away from the wrong ideologies that they're in and towards the, the right positions. Not only is that the case, but you're able to, to, to focus on one issue and bring a mass base of people into that one issue. And the paradox is that this is the, the people that rejected that sort of event are the ones that are perfectly fine with talking about building a mass uh, popular uh, front against war or something or a mass peace movement. But it seems to be that the only parts of the mass that they want to accept are the liberal ones. <laughs> so there's already some qualifications before who can be part of the anti-war movement. Yes, 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 everyone anti-war, but you have to be with us on these, you know, identity issues. And it's not that those issues aren't important. It's that, you know, the issue of escalating warfare into a nuclear Armageddon, I'm sorry, is a little bit more important. And that's the one that has to be emphasized. Absolutely. Um there's a lot of people talking about Ibram X. Kendi in the chat. Um, for those who don't know, he's like one of these scholars pushing diversity. I was just perusing through his website while I was listening to Carlos talk there. This guy is the face of bourgeois academia. <laughs> website with these speaking events, how to be a young anti-racist and... It reminds me of what Rock Hill says, like you, the bourgeois academy doesn't need, you know, like the CIA doesn't necessarily need to pay people directly um, to put out ideologies like this that are harmful to class struggle. They just create the ability to become an academic superstar, right? They, they give people who are willing to push this ideology a huge boost and treat them like they're, you know, saying something so profound and you know, people should pay thousands of dollars to come hear them speak. And if you know what Ibram X. Kendi writes about, he basically said this is his theory that every action you take or every word you speak is either racist or anti-racist. So you need to, you know, make sure all your words and actions are anti-racist. It's just this like um, absurd, like individualistic uh, liberal ideology um, that he's getting paid thousands and thousands of dollars to speak about and write about um so that's ibram x kendi for those who don't know all the bourgeoisie um, has to do is create the theater and the clowns come on their own sometimes they don't even stay long enough to pick up the paycheck um they don't need to but no uh, the, the reality is that the, you know there is a material element in it you know that's how much money has this uh fella been able to make off of his grift and how many other institutions and people are hired that perpetuate this uh, new modern form of liberal um, uh, capitalist imperialist ideology. So, um, you know, it's 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 in the self interest of of these. And you know, what's sad is that you look at socialist uh, or democratic socialist organizations, but you can say socialist as well. Um, you look at democratic socialist organizations and where they're pulling a lot of their leading activists um, and leading people from. Look at an organization like DSA. Um, they come from the same institutions and places as the places that proliferate the sorts of things. And, you know, with the concept that um, that I've been using um, in line with others to think about that is the iron triangle of the academy, the media and the NGOs. That's where these people are raised uh, politically and culturally and the manners with which they approach politics. 
it's all completely overlapped with these other folks that are just, you know, the complete puppets of the left wing of capital. Absolutely. Um, well, I think I'm about ready to, to call it a stream. Um, unless you had anything else you want to talk about. Um, got our usual stuff that we like to promote, but, um, or do you have anything else you wanted to touch on before we end it here? Um, not really. I know, I know we had five topics to hit on, but I knew that getting to my article would be a stretch, and that's maybe something we can mm -hmm. leave. That's right. We'll have to get next time. Stream. I'd like to make that into a, a segment of its own. It's actually a part of, it's a section of my upcoming book that I decided to uh, to submit as an article because someone, a few people in the chat brought up last time, like, you know, that national nihilism idea is kind of cool. What does it mean? Can you develop it a little more? So I felt like it was, it, it was helpful to, you know, sort of release that part of the book before the, the whole book. But um, yeah, we can get to that na last uh, next time. But just want to remind everyone that if you haven't already, please do uh, check out the Second issue of the Journal of American Socialist Studies. Uh, we put a ton of work into this. A lot of great articles. A lot of you know countless hours of editing and um, designing and, and designing the cover and, and you know and just doing all the backstage work that goes into the product that you end up having in your hands or on your laptop if you buy it uh, as an ebook. But you can purchase an ebook copy for ten bucks or a paperback copy for thirty bucks. Um, again, it's, you know, we wish to have it as cheap as possible, but, um, 30 bucks is the lowest we can go. It's got art. It's got a bunch of nice stuff inside and, uh, it's an academic, you know, peer reviewed, uh, journal. Uh, and, uh, if you try to get any other academic peer reviewed journal and paper, they're going to charge you 250 bucks or something for, for, for an issue. So <laughs> I think uh, 30 bucks is pretty darn cheap. Um, and you get to support our institute, which uh, is definitely in need of financial support. Uh, you can also check out our other books that we've published, um, No Great Wall by Carlos Martinez, my book, Marxism and, and the Dialectical Materialist Worldview, two books from Dr. Riggins, uh, one on Eurocommunism and one on reading the classical text of Marxism. You can check all of those out at midwesternmarx.com slash books. Uh, and uh, that you could also find the, the journal there for, for purchase, I think. Eddie has probably put it in the link in the chat. If not, you can find it in the description of this video or on our on our website. So uh, check that out and, and thank you all for, for sticking around this long. Absolutely. Buy our books, because your boy just got fired. <laughs> all right, thank you everyone for being with us this long. This has been the Midwestern March Podcast. <laughs>